A few years ago, the BBC broadcast a service from a charismatic Catholic church. And when you uh, listened to all the choruses and saw all the guitars, it really was a very lively act of worship. In between the songs, the BBC anchorman interviewed members of the congregation. And he got hold of an elderly lady and he said to this lady, how long have you been coming to this church? And she said, ever since I was a little girl of nine. My, said the BBC interviewer, you must have seen some big changes in the church in that time. She said, I have. She said, if the Lord Jesus, sorry, if Jesus himself knew about all the changes our new priest has made, he'd turn in his grave. <laughs> I won't draw out the implications of that. But we have seen in the last 30 years more changes in the content and style of worship than in the previous 300. Let me mention one or two of them. For example, we now have much more music in our worship and therefore more musicians. A subtle change that you may not have noticed is that we now shut our eyes for praise and open them for prayer. Whereas I was brought up to shut my eyes for prayer and open them for praise. Instead of the up and down, up and down, up and down of former worship when we stood and sat and stood and sat, we now stand for what seems like eternity, have one long stand and then one long sit quite a change. Worship is much more physical. Whole bodies are involved, certainly hands and feet and arms and legs. That never happened 40 years ago in church of all places. We are led by a group usually rather than an individual in worship. There are now more often one service a Sunday than two in most fellowships. Worship has become more visual than verbal. Banners have appeared, flags have appeared. There are things to see. Worship is more of a happening, an, a, an event. The word ministry no longer applies to either the word or the sacraments. It usually applies to praying for people at the end of a service, praying for individuals. I'm often asked, do you have ministry after you've spoken? I say, no, I have it while I'm speaking. <laughs> but there's a whole new jargon terminology that has crept in. And above all, technology has taken over. We have overhead projectors and screens. We have mixing desks at the back. In fact, when I speak on a platform today, I have to be very careful where I put my feet. It's like a telephone exchange <laughs> with wires all over the place and monitor speakers here and big speakers there. And now the latest, of course, is a long box with a moving line of the chorus coming up in moving lights. I'm sure you've seen that. And in fact, you can sing better when you're looking up than when you're looking down at a hymn book or hymn sheet. And so many changes have taken place. And we want to ask, are these changes for better or worse? For richer or poorer? <laughs> Till death us do part. Is it going to be like this for the rest of our lives? I'm one of the older group that has had to exercise a bit of patience now and again and uh, recognize that young people like to worship this way. But we need to ask some very big questions about worship. Where is it going? Is anybody aware of where it should be going, or where it could be going? Well, when you look into the future, when you're looking at a road map, to find out where you should be going, the first thing is to find out where you came from. And the second thing is to find out where you are. And only if you do that are you in a position to find out where you should be going. 
And so we've got three subjects today, worship yesterday, where we've come from, worship today, where we are right now, and worship tomorrow, where we could or should be going in the future. And these talks are being recorded, of course, primarily for those responsible to lead others in worship. But I'm sure that even if you're not in your local fellowship, you'll find these talks illuminating. So the first subject is worship yesterday. And we're going to go back into the past and trace how we got to where we are. Now, how far should we go back? My answer is to the very beginning. I want to start with Cain and Abel. But before we begin to look at the history of worship, let's define what we're looking for. What is worship? And we'll start with some word studies. The word worship in English is a very interesting word. It's a shortened form of worth-ship. It is how to show someone what they are worth to you. That's worship. And when we gather for worship on a Sunday, we are gathering to show God how much he is worth to us. And even in what we put in the collection, that will show. But we are there to declare he is worthy and worthy of the best that we can give him because he's more worthy of our gifts and our attention than anybody else. And of course, to show someone what they're worth to you, a very simple thing to do is to spend time with them, quality time, to give attention to them, not just to talk all the time, but to listen to them. You declare what a person's opinion is worth to you by listening carefully to what they say. And so worship can be a two-way thing. It's not just giving and talking to someone. It's listening to them, paying attention to them, spending quality time with them, if that's what they are worth to you. Parents will show children what they're worth to them in the same way. In other words, communication is a vital part of worth-ship. Now that's the English word, but let's go to the biblical words. In the Greek and the Hebrew, a number of words are used in the Bible for worship. They're translated worship in the English. One is service. In fact, the most common word in Greek and Hebrew for worship is the word service. And we still talk about a worship service or a service of worship. But the essential meaning of that word service is not to be doing things. It primarily refers to a servant's attitude. It's more than obedience. That's doing something for the one you serve. It is, to use a very old-fashioned word that's in the dictionary but never used today, it is obeisance. Now, a servant has an attitude to someone they're going to serve. But since there are very few servants today, we uh, have lost the meaning of that attitude. It means to pay attention to someone and to accept that they are superior to yourself in some way. It is to adopt the attitude of a servant towards someone else. We're going to see later that that means not initiating the conversation, but waiting for the one you serve to speak first, and then responding to what they say to you. When we gather in church, we are gathering as servants of God, and that should be our attitude. It should be demonstrated in how we behave. We are there as subjects of the King, as servants of God Almighty. We are there for an act of service as well as worship. 
There are other words that are used. One particular word that is used is to place yourself lower than somebody else, to go down before them. Once again, it's the acknowledgement of a superior person. To bow is to put yourself in that lower position in relation to somebody else. Now we shall say later that there's much more of this kind of worship in a mosque than in the average church today. We don't even kneel. We crouch for prayer. We don't bow. We don't go down before the Lord. But that's one of the words used in the Hebrew and the Greek for worship. To place yourself below someone else. To acknowledge that they are above you. To acknowledge their greatness and your smallness by comparison. Well, we'll come back to that. But let's now trace the history of worship over the last millennium. Um, let's go back to Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel wanted to show God how much he was worth to them, and they both brought an offering. Cain brought fruits of the field because he was a farmer, Whereas Abel brought a sacrificial animal because he was a herdsman. And it says that God accepted Abel's offering but not Cain's. Now they both brought the produce of their hands in a sense. Why did God not accept Cain's? Now we're not told and all this is speculation. They should have learned from Adam and Eve and the sacrifice of animals to provide skins to cover their sin. They should have learned from that that God demands sacrifice. Or it may be that Cain wanted to bring what he wanted to bring. I don't know why God did not accept one brother's offering. And it led, of course, to the murder of Abel through the jealousy and anger of Cain. But Cain should have stopped and asked questions and said, why didn't God take my offering? And here we come across a basic principle which should apply all the way through worship right to today and beyond. And that principle is to find out what God wants from us and not give him what we think he wants. That's a very important principle because worship is for God and therefore it involves finding out what kind of offering he wants from us and not just bringing anything that we want to do or we want to give. So that's starting right at the beginning. Their younger brother Shem began a long line of people, it says, who began to call on the name of the Lord who began to worship, jumped to Abraham. One of the loveliest things that's frequently said about Abraham is this. He pitched his tent and built an altar. Wherever that man went, he did two things. Made a home for his family and provided for worship. Everywhere he went, pitched his tent, made an altar, and he knew, of course, that God needed sacrifice in worship. And all through the Old Testament, if you'd gone to worship God, you'd have had to take an animal and have its throat slit. I sometimes wonder what modern churches would be like if we still had to do that. The only reason why you don't still have to do that is because of Jesus. Otherwise, you would still have to come as Abel came, as Abraham came, as Moses came, and as all the Israelites had to come with a costly sacrifice that really did cost them something. And it had to be the best animal they had. Any old animal wouldn't do for God to show how worthy he is to us, how worth our best, you bring the very best animal you've got, the one that would command the highest price in the market. When you read... For example, the prophet Malachi, he says, you're bringing blind animals and lame animals to God as if any old thing will do. Is that what he's worth to you? 
the leftovers, the ones you can't sell. Now all this is so relevant to worship, isn't it? What's God worth to you? What does it cost you to worship him? Is it a sacrifice? Well, let's move on. Moses introduced the Sabbath. There is no trace of a weekly day set aside for worship in the whole of Genesis. Moses introduced it and explained it by God's rest on the seventh day of creation. When we read Genesis 1, we assume quite wrongly that Adam knew all that, but he didn't. He wasn't told that. Adam didn't have a Sabbath. Abraham didn't. Isaac didn't. Jacob didn't. Joseph didn't. It was introduced when they were released from seven-day work in slavery in Egypt. And God gave them a day's rest, but also said, it's a day for me. One-seventh of your time is for me, and one-tenth of your money is for me. We are not under either law. We're not under the Sabbath law. We're not under the tithe law. Though some preachers talk as if we are both. We're not. But that's how it was introduced. And therefore from then on, their worship concentrated on the day set apart for God the Sabbath. And under Moses, they erected the first building of worship. Until then, it was simply an altar, a pile of stones, a can, outside the tent, near enough for the family to worship. But from Moses onwards, it was associated with a building, a portable building at first called the tabernacle. But the building itself is worth study because that building was to teach the people how to approach God or how not to. Because around it was a high fence the worship inside was hidden from the outsider by that fence right around the tabernacle. And even inside there were veils and curtains hiding God. Telling people don't rush into God's presence. Be careful how you approach God. And in fact in the place where God was, the Holy of Holies, a cube right in the middle no one was allowed to go into that except one man once a year, the high priest, who would go in on behalf of his people. And it was there that with no windows and a completely enclosed cube, it was brilliantly lit by God's Shekinah glory. All that tells you an awful lot. At the very entrance to the outer court, the first thing you see was an altar where sacrifice could be made before you went any further. And beyond that was a huge wash basin, a huge bowl of water where you could cleanse yourself before going any nearer to God who is so clean that everybody will feel dirty by comparison in his presence. We can learn an awful lot about worship from the tabernacle, but let's move on. Worship was in the hands of a special group of people called priests, led by the high priest. They wore vestments. They burned incense. These things sound familiar to you? We're going to see later how all this came back into the church when it shouldn't have done. Priests, altars, vestments, incense. It all belongs to a way of worship that is now obsolete. But it was the way the Jews learned how to be careful with God, not to play games with him, not to rush into his presence ill-prepared, but to realize he was a holy God, that he lived in the holy of holies, and that there was a right way and a wrong way to approach him. They had, of course, full-time priests who were supported by the rest of the people, who in a sense offered the worship to God on their behalf. Later they built a temple and it became a permanent building in Jerusalem. 
And now they had huge choirs and orchestras, many musicians, all paid, all professional, you might say, and they kept up this constant pattern of worship to God in the temple. Only three times a year did ordinary Jews go near the temple. They went up for the main feasts. The three biggest, of course, were um, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was then that they had huge celebrations with hundreds of singers and all the musical instruments they could lay their hands on. And then they had this festival three times a year. I'm going to show you that that was not a model for Christian worship. But it was the way they were learning how big God is. And from time to time it is always inspiring to meet with a God-sized congregation. To feel that you're not just the local fellowship in Little Puddle come in the marsh. But that you belong to a God-sized people. Something big. The biggest celebration I've heard of was when three million Christians gathered together in Korea. Now that's a celebration. And I can hardly imagine what it was like to join in, but uh, they had to have an airport runway for the main meeting. Well, that's what happened three times a year. And it was for that kind of worship that David wrote some of his psalms. Many of his psalms were personal love songs to the Lord, personal cries to the Lord when he was in trouble, when he was being hounded even to his life. And many of the psalms were written for his private devotions. They're what I call I psalms. But other psalms and songs he wrote for the big celebration in Jerusalem. There's a whole bunch of five of them called the Hallel songs or the praise songs written for Aliyah, which is going up to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. And these songs are all about going up to Jerusalem excitedly, enthusiastically looking forward to the big celebration up there. And these are what I call we psalms written for people to sing together. And we need to notice this. Many choruses today and many hymns today fall into those two categories. But I'm going to say later that too many of them fall into the I category and far too few into the we category. Many are songs that a person by themselves with a guitar was just singing to God. And that's good. David did that. But when we translate that into public worship, we tend to split the congregation up into a lot of little eyes. And it ceases to be corporate worship and becomes individual worship in the same room, if you know what I mean. So the Psalms were written for private devotions and for public corporate worship and therefore should be used similarly. Now when the children of Israel so misbehaved that they were taken out of their own land, the promised land which God had given them, they had to leave all the temple worship behind. All the priests and the choirs and the musicians became obsolete because there was no altar now no sacrifices, nothing. The temple worship had disappeared. The big celebrations had gone. Now, it's interesting why they were taken into exile and for how long. It's not directly related to my subject, but I thought, I thought you'd be interested. For 500 years, they had neglected to give the land a fallow year every seventh year. They'd taken crops round the calendar, as it were, and the land had not had its Sabbath rest. Sabbath means seventh. And it hadn't had its seventh rest for 500 years. So how many years had it missed its holiday? Seventy. 
And so God said, you go out of the land and I give the land the rest it should have had. And after 70 years, you can come back. Interesting little sideline there. It's in the last chapter of Chronicles. That's why Daniel knew that after 70 years, they could go back. Nehemiah knew it as well. Now then, in the exile, what were they to do to worship God? No priests, no choirs, no orchestra, no sacrifice, no altar, no vestments, no incense, no nothing. And it was in Babylon that they developed a totally different style of worship. They called it Come Together. I wonder if many of you remember the musical Come Together. That's what they decided to call it. In Greek, come together is synagogue. So now you know where the word synagogue comes from. And what they decided to do was every Sabbath to come together to synagogue, whether they had a building or not, didn't matter. The synagogue was a gathering of the people, an assembly of Jews once a week on the Sabbath. And they did four things. First of all, well, no, I won't give you them in the order at the moment. There was praise, songs, though they found it difficult singing songs of rejoicing in a strange land. And they hung their harps on the willow trees because they didn't even want to play them. Then there was prayer and there was preaching. The reading and expounding or explaining of God's scriptures and there was the Shema, the creed, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So those were the four items, a very simple outline of worship, praise, prayer, preaching, and the creed. And they did that each Sabbath. After a bit, they became a little more organized as fellowships, they even managed to get some buildings that were suitable for their worship. Very simple buildings in which they gathered around the word, usually literally in a circle or a square more frequently. And they needed a bit more structure to the fellowship. So they developed elders in Babylon. And these were mature Jews who oversaw the activities of the fellowship. They also developed deacons. And the deacons looked after all the practical side, the money, the funds that were used for the poor, the building, and so on. One little thing I would add about the music. They didn't have an orchestra or a band. They had a cantor. Uh, a singer, a Jewish singer with a good voice who could lead the congregation in singing. Now that's the pattern. And I would strongly urge any worship leader to go to the nearest synagogue today and study their worship. Because you will find that identical outline of worship in every synagogue in the whole world today. And some of their cantors have beautiful singing voices. And their music, there was... Uh, did you see the BBC broadcasting a synagogue service? I tell you, the, the singing and the worship was just beautiful. I think I've got a recording of it at home. But, uh, I, I met Christians who said to me, I wish we could worship like that in our church. It can be beautiful. It can be pretty dead as well. It varies from synagogue to synagogue. But the content, forget the style for a moment, the content, I've told you, is very clear. When they came back from exile and were able to rebuild the temple, of course they got back into the temple style of worship as well. And so priests came back, Altars came back, sacrifices came back, vestments and incense all came back, but for the temple, not for the synagogue. 
So the Jew of those days after the exile had two styles of worship. One was his local style, the synagogue, and there were synagogues in each town and village, which he went to every week. And the other was the temple style worship, which he went to three times a year, if he could. They were very special times. And there was no hint whatever that in their local worship they should copy the temple worship. That's an important point I want to make. It's going to come up again and again today. The local worship was quite different and they didn't feel it was inferior because they didn't have paid singers or orchestras. They simply had singing God's praise, praying to him, hearing the word read and explained and declaring their faith in the Shema, the creed of the Jewish people. And that brings us right up to Jesus' day when the temple had become huge. When they rebuilt it after the exile, it was tiny. And one of the prophets, Haggai, said, don't despise the day of small things. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. And King Herod rebuilt it on such a scale that on the platform, the stone platform that he built to stand it on, you could stand 13 English cathedrals side by side. It was gigantic and it was impressive. So impressive that it was still being built when Jesus visited it. And it was of that that he said, not one stone will be left standing on another. Can you imagine saying that of a building that size? But it brought back the whole paraphernalia, if I may use the word, of the sacrificial system. And we call that system sacerdotal because it means it can only be done by a special people called priests. Ordinary people couldn't go and do anything in the temple worship. It had to be the priests, specially set apart for that job to lead the worship and to make the sacrifices. And so came Jesus. Now, the most significant thing in Jesus' life was really in his death. As he died, the veil in the temple was split from top to bottom. It was about 60 feet high and it literally was torn by invisible hands from the top, not from the bottom. It was clearly torn up by God and inside was nothing, darkness. That was the moment when temple worship ceased. They actually repaired the veil and carried on for another 40 years, but without God. That system had gone. No longer were priests needed to make sacrifices. Putting it quite crudely, God tore it up. And when Jesus said it is finished, you can apply that in more ways than one. But the whole sacrificial system with its priests and its vestments and its incense was gone. I like to put it this way. How do you know when a house is not lived in? How do you know when it's empty? Usually because there are no curtains. The curtains have been taken down. Or as Americans say, the drapes have gone. And in a sense, that was what happened when Jesus died. And we now know, because the New Testament tells us, that it was finished because it was only a copy of the real thing. It was a copy on earth of something in heaven. The real holy of holies where God lives is not down here but up there. And as the high priest would enter into the holy of holies down here with the blood of the sacrifice to sprinkle, so our high priest, Jesus, has entered the heavenly holy of holies. And this time it really has worked. 
Because as we know from the letters to the Hebrews, the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament never did the trick. They never actually did what they were represented to do. That's why they had to be repeated time and time again. None of them actually was a final cure for sin. Now we have such a sacrifice and Jesus has entered the heaven holy of holies with his own blood to present his sacrifice which is once for all and finished with and will never need to be done again. The result of all this was that the early church worship was based on the synagogue and not on the temple. There I'm saying it again, but I'll be saying it all the way through because it's the most important thing I'll be saying. And so when you study the early church life, they met together once a week at least, and they met together for prayer and for praise and for hearing the apostles' doctrine as it now became, scriptures expounded in a fresh way. At first they only had the Old Testament, but even that they now discovered was all about Jesus from cover to cover. He had told them in his resurrection weeks about the law and the prophets and the writing that all of it was about himself. And so the first Christians used the Old Testament as Christian scriptures, plus what the apostles now were able to teach who had lived with him for three years. One interesting little thing is this. You know the verse in Acts 2, verse 42, I think, where it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Not and prayer. They did continue to use the Jewish prayers. Indeed, while the temple stood, they went there to pray. They were there on the day of Pentecost at nine o'clock in the morning. And nine o'clock was the first time for the set prayer. Sorry, the second time. The third hour of the day. And so they were still attending the temple prayers. But there is no record of them ever having anything to do with the priests or the sacrifices or anything of that. They simply met together there. It was a good place to meet. It was in the middle of the city. But they continued in the prayers. There's a funny equation widely accepted today which I don't believe, and that is that spontaneous is more spiritual than prepared. And even preachers have fallen into that trap. The, the more spontaneous we are, the more we ad lib in worship, the more spiritual that will be. No, no. The early believers, of course, were Jews, and they were used to saying the prayers and using form as well as freedom in worship. Never forget that the early church was largely Jewish. Even hundreds of priests were converted and joined it. But they worshipped as if they were in a Christian synagogue. The only difference between synagogue worship and the early Christian worship was that they added the breaking of bread. At first it was a full meal. But that was abused, as we know in Corinth, for example, people were coming early and grabbing all the food and drinking all the wine and getting drunk. What a mess. And so fairly early on, it ceased to be a meal, or rather the meal became a separate thing, which they called the love feast or the agape. And in the worship, they had token bread and wine, as we still do. That was never in the synagogue. And what was it? It was essentially a remembrance that they no longer needed the temple. They no longer needed the priest. They no longer needed an altar. They no longer needed sacrifice. Because now they could remember the sacrifice which made all that obsolete. 
You still with me? So we're beginning to see a development. When worship was extended to the Gentiles, who had no Jewish background, it still followed the synagogue practice plus the Lord's Supper. So the service really was in two parts. There was the synagogue service plus gathering at the Lord's table. And you find that everywhere. There was, however, a real uh, introduction of spontaneous contributions because the Spirit was releasing gifts and contributions from the people. At first, of course, for the first 300 years, they had no buildings. They gathered in homes and always sat in a circle. And the only thing they really needed was a table. And the table was in the center. And I want you to imagine a large room in a Roman villa with a table in the middle and a circle of worshippers. But there would be a combination of what had been prepared and what was spontaneous. Gifts like prophecy and tongues were exercised freely, though of course always controlled and regulated. A tongue had to be interpreted. A prophecy, you could have two or three, but no more. I mean, if God is going to take the trouble to speak to you directly, if you have five or six, you're going to forget the first three by the time you get the second three. Only two or three, because you need to pay attention. And each one needs to be weighed and judged, because a person can give a prophecy and it may be not from God at all. Or usually I've found it's a mixture and you can tell which is from God and which is from the person by the pause. Do you know what I mean? A word pours out and then there's a pause. And then there's more. And it's almost as if the person giving it thinks, that's too short. I must improve on that. I must add a bit. I have known that again and again. And you need to weigh and judge. Is this of God? Is it all of God? Is some of it of God? And what is God telling us to do about it? I find a singular lack of weighing and judging in fellowships that have prophecies. But it's all to be done decently and in order so that it edifies the people and isn't a distraction. I'll come back to that later. So now we have the Gentile worship. And it says this, that when you come together, each one has a song, a reading, a tongue, prophecy. Each one has. It doesn't say each one may get one. It says each one has. And the clear implication is that the people who walked into the Christian synagogue had already prepared for worship had got something to bring and contribute to the service. You see, the opposite to one man preparing the whole worship is not nobody preparing, but everybody preparing. And to rush ahead, I can think of some of the most beautiful services of worship we had in our church, usually when we went away for the weekend and had the time to do it. And we had one hour's silence before the worship began. And each person went away by themselves to prepare for the worship and come with something to contribute. A song, a reading or whatever. And because we would had prepared, all of us, for an hour, the whole worship just flowed. And all we needed to do was ask the Holy Spirit when was the right time to bring my contribution. And it was amazing how much the Holy Spirit revealed in those acts of worship. It seems quite clearly that the Christians spent time before they went to worship seeking God for something that they could contribute and God would give them something. And then they would come ready to take part. Not just ad-libbing and suddenly getting a thought and coming out with it, but coming with something that the Holy Spirit would use to contribute to the whole. 
each one has already. They've got something from God to offer as part of the worship. That's a lovely thought, isn't it? You're allowed to shout hallelujah if you like. (laughs) There are no rules laid down in the New Testament for what we have to do in worship. There's no order of service there. There's a flexibility there. The two things we are told are that it's to be in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth means you are no longer dependent on a building or a place. I don't know whether to laugh or cry at the program Sunday. Do you listen on Sunday morning to the program Sunday? It's very good. But they're now having a competition. What is the most spiritual place in Britain? (laughs) And I take my hat off to the Jewish rabbi. Others have talked about these beautiful cathedrals or uh, beautiful forests they've been in. But the rabbi said, Euston Station. (laughs) I thought, bully for you. (laughs) Because to God, the sacred place is where the people are. The temple of God today is not a building or a garden. It's people. You are nearer to God's heart on a tube train than anywhere else on earth. Worshipping in spirit sets you free from your environment, free from the place. I loved that old Scottish woman who was asked by her pastor, uh, I forget what he asked, but her reply was, I just sit in my chair and throw my apron over my head and I'm in the Holy of Holies. (laughs) In spirit means you are not dependent on gothic archways and soaring naves and, or even banners or anything else. You are in the spirit already. And in truth, the word means reality. The word true and the word real are the same word in the Greek and the Hebrew. So you can actually translate true or truth with real or reality all the way through the Bible. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am for real. Truth and reality are the same thing. And to worship in truth means to be really worshipping. To doing it sincerely. Doing it in reality. And not just going through the motions. An awful lot of parrots in church, you know. There's a dear old lady in South Wales in a home for the elderly. And she has a budgerigar that can sing hymns. And it can sing a whole verse of what a friend we have in Jesus. And when visitors come into the home, they hear a little voice, what a friend we have in Jesus. They look around and here's a budgie. And they're so impressed, they push coins through the cage. Don't know why. And she collects them up and sends them to a missionary in Africa. And she sent nearly 200 pounds. (laughs) That budgie is doing more than many church members. It praises God every day. And it's supporting a missionary in Africa. God doesn't want parrots. He wants worship in truth in reality. Well now let's move on. I think I'll move towards the end of the first century or the beginning of the second. We have at last the first record of a Sunday morning service in the church. By the way, why Sunday morning? Why did Christians worship on the first day of the week instead of the last day of the week? Especially since the early believers were mostly Jews. Astonishing change. Can you imagine trying to change Christians to worshipping on a Monday? Or Muslims to not worshipping on a Friday? It's an astonishing change. I once climbed into the pulpit in Guildford on an Easter Sunday morning and in the notices I said, uh, <clears throat> we've decided from now on to worship on a Monday rather than Sunday. It'll have to be early in the morning and late at night because you'll be at work So from now on the services will be at 6 a.m. and 10 (laughs) p.m. 
on Mondays. And I managed to say with a straight face, and there were people saying, how will we manage that? <laughs> and you could see they took me seriously. But I said, isn't it amazing that the early believers, Jews, decided to worship on the first working day of the week instead of the rest day? Well, they were doing it because they believed that Jesus was the beginning of the new creation. That on the first Easter Sunday, God went back to work. He had been resting on the seventh day all through the Old Testament. The word new doesn't occur at, hardly at all in the Old Testament. I can only think of one verse. Behold, there is nothing new under the sun. When God finished his work of creation in six days, he rested on the seventh and it lasted for centuries. But on Easter Sunday, God went back to work and started his new creation and started it with Jesus' body. Early Christians either said the first day of the week or the eighth day. We are living in the eighth day of creation. We're in the second week of creation. God's back at work. In the old creation, he made man and woman last, and the heaven and the earth first. In the new creation, he's making new men and women first, and the new heaven and the new earth last. Other way around. But he's back at work. And the resurrection of Jesus doesn't just mean Jesus back from the dead, it means the new creation has begun. And now God is making new men and women for the new heaven and the new earth. And if any man is in Christ, there is the new creation, said Paul. Isn't it exciting? And that's why they worshipped God on the eighth day, the first day of the week, the day of the new creation, when he began to make new things. He not only made a new body for his son that looked like the old body but was new, he even made a brand new set of clothes for his son. Did you ever wonder where Jesus got his clothes from in the resurrection? You knew he left all his grave clothes behind. Where do you think he got new clothes? Do you think he stole them or begged them or borrowed them or went to St. Michael for them? no God made him a new body and new set of clothes it was the beginning of the new creation God the creator had been at work in the tomb as he'd been at work in the womb at the beginning of his life now all that switched days for the Christians now of course the Roman Empire didn't have a weekly holiday they had a rest day every ten days and so the new day of worship for the early believers didn't fit the Jewish holiday and it didn't fit the Roman holiday. So what did they do? They gathered at sunrise and at sunset for worship. And we have a document called the Didache, which means teaching uh, from the first century describing a Sunday service. On the day of the sun we gather for two hours. The first hour we spend in reading and having taught the word of God. The second hour we spend in praise and prayer, finally gathering around the Lord's table. A two-hour service at sunrise for the early believers. And the thing that sticks right out is that it's a synagogue service. And of course those early fellowships developed elders and deacons as the synagogue had. And that comes out even in the New Testament. Now let's look very quickly at 2,000 years of church history and what has happened to worship. Well, something happened which was not a good move. The second half of the Christian worship began to swallow up the first half. 
And the Lord's Supper or the breaking of bread or the Eucharist, that simply is a Greek word saying thank you, uh, became the focus and the very heart of worship. But something happened in addition to that and around that, which was a bad, a retrograde step. It began to be regarded as a sacrifice presented to God afresh. And with it there came a reversion to the whole temple system. Priests, vestments, incense, the table ceased to be a table and became the altar at which only priests, professional priests, ordained priests could officiate. And the bread and the wine became a repeated sacrifice rather than a remembered sacrifice. And we've got the Mass. I'm squeezing centuries into a very short time, but can you see what began to happen? And this sacrificial act became the act of worship. And as the priests took over that act of sacrifice at the altar, the people became more and more spectators rather than actors in worship. They watched it happen, and it was done by the priests. The architecture changed. After Constantine the emperor was converted, Christians were allowed to build churches, indeed encouraged to. He did it himself. And they modeled their church buildings on the Roman Basilica, which is a large oblong hall like this, with two rows of pillars down either side supporting the roof. And the table, now become an altar, moved from the middle of the congregation to the end wall and would be here. As they developed, they developed a kind of semicircular dent in the end wall called an apse. And the table or altar was moved into this, what's the word I want, the alcove. Gradually that alcove got bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, it was a place not only for the altar, but for the priests. And in their robes, they would line this extension at this end, while the people were all at that end. Ultimately, somebody had the brilliant idea of building Christian buildings in the shape of a huge cross. Just imagine the cross like this. Where is the altar now? It's right up at the top end. And then there are seats for the priests in their robes. Then there's a huge gap. And then the people are at the other end of the tunnel. They are further and further removed. As in the days of the temple and the tabernacle. And then the idea was introduced of having a screen between the people down there and the altar and priests up here. And worship became invisible to the people. The Orthodox churches have taken it one stage further and that screen doesn't have any holes in it, whatever. It's covered with icons, pictures of Jesus and Mary and the saints. And the people in an Orthodox church cannot see a thing that's going on in the worship. They can hear, but they can't see. It is an extraordinary development and contrary to the New Testament. It was waiting, of course, for the Reformation. And the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation in Northern Europe went back to the Word of God. They didn't go all the way back, but they went a long way back. And they realized how far things had gone wrong. There were now seven sacraments which the priests administered and only priests could administer. The reformers reduced them back to the two that go back to Jesus, baptism and the Lord's Supper. The other sacraments of extreme unction, 
matrimony and others, the reformers said are not sacraments at all. And so they simplified worship. They reintroduced congregational participation to a degree, not to a great degree, but they did reintroduce congregational singing. And Luther wrote a number of songs. He, he played the guitar too. And his most famous song is A Safe Stronghold Our God Is Still. Do you know that? A safe stronghold our God is still. Do you know that he wrote that against Islam? Because Islam was invading Europe. And he wrote that as a comfort to Christians who were frightened that Islam was going to take over. I find that very interesting. Worship was put back into the language of the people. Hitherto it had been in Latin, which most people didn't know or understand. But now they had a German Bible translated by Luther. So in a number of ways, it be, it, worship was given back to the people. Music being the main one. However, the different reformers had different ideas on that. Luther believed you could write new songs for the Lord. Have you ever noticed that the Lord never says, sing me one of my old favorite hymns? <laughs> he always says, sing a new song to the Lord. He's heard that one thousands of times. Anyway, Luther believed you could write new songs for the Lord, and he did. Calvin was a bit more strict in Geneva, and he decided that we should only sing what's in the Bible. And therefore, the book of Psalms became the hymn book for the Reformed churches in Geneva. John Knox took that to Scotland, and if you've been to Scotland, you know the metrical Psalms, the Psalms put into modern verse and sung by the people of Scotland in the Hebrides without an organ but with a cantor, with a singer. Interesting. Zwingli, the third greatest reformer and the least well-known, who worked in Zurich in Switzerland, he forbade all singing and all musical instruments. But I think he took it too far. Now, worship had been for the Catholic Church very visual. Stained glass windows told the stories of the Gospel and the Old and New Testament. Statues of saints, gargoyles reminded the people of devils. If you go to a medieval cathedral, almost anywhere in Europe, you'll see a scene of the Last Judgment above the west door as you enter with people going into heaven and others being thrown into hell in stone sculpture. It was all very visual. And the reformers believed that worship should be verbal rather than visual. They understood the phrase in spirit to mean that your spirit should worship inside rather than your eyes outside. And so they began an iconoclasm a destruction of statues, of banners, of all visual aids to worship. Keep it simple. Cut all that out. It was the restoration of the word as the central factor in worship. What you hear rather than what you see. And if you go to Calvin's church in Geneva, you'll find inside it was a Gothic medieval cathedral full of statues, full of paintings. They've all gone. And it was at that stage that many churches in England that had mural paintings on the wall had them whitewashed. And now, of course, they're uncovering many of them and restoring them, but that all happened, cutting down the visual outside distractions of worship and going back to worship in spirit and in truth. We'll discuss later how much of that was good. But the major thing was this. After the Reformation, preaching was called the royal sacrament. Mm. 
and put above baptism and the Lord's Supper, the sermon became the most important thing in worship. It was the climax of the service. The Lord's Supper actually became less and less frequent after the Reformation. If you are Scottish, you know that it's an annual thing, the Lord's Supper in Scotland, once a year at Easter. But in other Reformed churches, in other Re Reformation circles, the Lord's Supper became less and less. And the word, the sermon, the preaching became more and more. Listening was part of worship. Now I believe that implicitly. If you do all the talking with someone and you never listen to them, you're not telling them how much they're worth to you. But uh, there it was. Now then, let's speak about yesterday in this country. And I mean by yesterday, the first half of the 20th century. There were four kinds of worship and Many of you who are grey-haired like me will remember one of them as the one in which you were brought up. First of all, the Catholic Mass continued in Latin. And when you went, you went as a spectator and you watched it happening. The important thing for you to do was to attend and be seen at Mass, to be there when the priests made their sacrifice to God at the altar. And they did it with their back to you. They were doing it for God. They were presenting the sacrifice to God, not to the congregation. And so all you saw was the back of the priest while he got on with his sacrifice to God at the altar. The altar in those churches would be right in the middle and the most prominent, usually lifted up, on steps and the pulpit would be somewhere at the side stuck on a column supporting the building. The pulpit was quite secondary in that the sacrifice of the mass was central and the most important and it was God oriented. Then there would be the Anglican and of course Anglicans are a bit of a mixture high, low and broad. <laughs> And the high would be more like the Catholic Mass. And the low would be more like the free churches. And the broad would be a mixture somewhere in between. But the important thing in Anglican style worship was it was set. Even the prayers were set. They were called collects. And the collect for the day was set. And other prayers too were set. It was a fixed form of worship. And it was gone through twice a Sunday, matins and evensong, morning and evening worship, followed much the same set pattern. There were set readings as well as set prayers, and even set sermons, homilies which could be read to the congregation. It was solemn, very serious, very restrained, very dignified, and reverent. But that was the second style of worship in the first half of the 20th century. The third was the free church style of worship, colloquially known as the hymn sandwich. You had a hymn, and a prayer, and a hymn, and a reading, and a hymn, and the offering, and a hymn, and the sermon, and a hymn. The hymn sandwich with lots of layers, and you were up, down, up, down. One difference is that in the Anglican church you would kneel for prayer, but in the free churches you would crouch. You would sit in the seat and you would bend like that. Very few free churches knelt. And that was the free church. That's the one I was brought up in. Great emphasis on singing, more singing by the congregation. And of course a lot of hymn writers uh, came on the free church side. Uh, one thinks of Charles Wesley. 6,000 hymns he wrote. By the way, isn't it interesting? The ones we still sing are all I hymns. And can it be that I should gain? 
over a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. He wrote a lot of we songs, but as I'm going to show later, so subjective have we become that it's all I songs, how I feel, and what I want to say to God. I'll come back to that. The sermon was the climax in the Free Church hymn sandwich, and what went before was called the preliminaries. Now, isn't that an interesting word? The songs and the readings and the prayers were all intended to prepare for the sermon. They were preliminaries to the climax. And the Lord's Supper became more of a postscript to worship and was held afterwards. Indeed, some people went before it it was uh, observed. And so the big thing was still the word, the sermon. And that's the one I was brought up in. Congregational participation was limited to singing hymns. There were two prayers, the short prayer and the long prayer. <laughs> but they were both offered by the preacher. And one of the tests of a good preacher was how long he could pray in the long prayer and uh, go around the world with all his requests. So uh, maybe I'm a caricaturing, but I think you recognize this style of worship. And that had prevailed for centuries, all those three. The fourth was a breakthrough and came about around 1830 in Dublin, the beginning of the movement called the Brethren. And John Nelson Darby, an Anglican curate, had twofold ambition. One was to get back to New Testament worship in which there was spontaneous contribution under the Holy Spirit. And secondly, to establish a kind, new kind of worship that all Christians and all churches could join in. He had a very ecumenical outlook, especially in the early days. And they began to meet in Dublin without anything prepared and sat around. I have to add that women did not participate, but the brothers were free to contribute whatever they felt the Spirit was leading them to do. And quite early on, the Spirit was giving prophecies and tongues. And this was totally unexpected. They hadn't banked on this at all. In fact, they'd, they'd thought that these things died out with the apostles and here they were happening again. So they called a conference to discuss this weird development. And quite objectively and sincerely, they discussed what to do about it. It was something they had just not planned for or expected when they handed over the worship to the Holy Spirit. Reluctantly, they decided that these things were so way out compared with traditional worship that it would bring their movement into disrepute, that it, would, it was just too radical. So very reluctantly, they decided not to allow such charismatic things to intrude into their worship. I believe the Brethren movement grieved the spirit that day. And now the situation is there are Brethren assemblies all over the world, but you can divide them clearly into two groups, those that are dying and those that are allowing the spirit to do things. But they pioneered a freer style of worship in theory to let the spirit lead. And it was a major move to become much more common in the second half of the 20th century. So how are we doing for time? Oh, we're not too bad. I've got 10 minutes more. Can you take 10 minutes more? I apologize for my voice. It gets very tired and husky since I had that stroke. Well, now, we've inherited a tradition. And many of us were brought up in one of those four traditions and never questioned it. Because in those days, when I was a lad, in the 1930s, there was no inter-church 
activity. You didn't go to other people's churches. You were brought up in your own, you stayed in your style of worship, and therefore you assumed that that was it really the only way to worship, or the best way. And uh, you prided yourself on being Anglican or Free Church or whatever. But those days, of course, were to go. We rarely sampled anything else. And in fact, I suppose until after World War II, I had never been in a church of another denomination to the Methodists that I was brought up in. It just didn't happen. I was ignorant of how other people worshipped. Of course, the Methodist style was a little bit of a mixture of Anglican and Free Church. Our communion services were identical with Anglicans. But the hymn sandwich uh, first was more Free Church. I remember years ago going to Liverpool and uh, we had in the central hall, which was then open, we had uh, an evangelistic rally. And I was standing in the foyer afterwards and a boy came towards me. He had, uh, what do you call those haircuts? Across the middle. Mohican hairdo. Red, I think it was. And he had on a Nazi war jacket and leather jackboots. And he came straight for me afterwards. (laughs) I wondered what I was in for. But he came and he took off the jacket And he thrust it into my hands and he said, take that thing away from me. He said, Jesus doesn't like the image. That was the night of his conversion. Gerald was changed by the Holy Spirit like that. And then he walked away. And I kicked myself out. I wanted to give him some money to get him another jacket because it looked as if that was the only one he had. But I've never seen him again from that day to this. But I met a pastor in Liverpool shortly afterwards. He said, oh, David, he said, you don't know what you've done to our church. I said, why? What have I done? Well, he said, there was a boy called Gerald came to your meeting in the central hall. And he said, the next Sunday he came to our church. And he brought all his pals with him. (laughs) And they all came in and they sat down and they glared at everybody. And he said... uh, I was leading the service, I said, now let's sing a hymn. So we all stood up, voices from these boys. What are you doing that for? He said, well, 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 we stand to sing. And all the way through the service, these lads were saying, why are you doing that? What are you shutting your eyes for? Why are you bending down looking as if you're going to be sick? Why are you doing all this? (laughs) And he said, we found that we couldn't answer the questions except to say, well, we've always done it like this. And he said, we had to start asking questions about our worship, why we did this, what effect it had on us, what we were trying to achieve. He said, we've, we've revised our whole worship. He said, the whole church has had to adapt itself so that we can explain to people why we do what we do. Now, that's what's going to be needed today. To stop just falling into the habits that we're in and say, why are we doing this? What effect is it having? What are we trying to achieve? And above all, does God enjoy this? That's the most important question. In the church my wife and I attend, the first announcement from the pulpit is we give a warm welcome to guests, to visitors, and we hope you'll enjoy the service. Is that what it's about? The real question is, did God enjoy it? And if he didn't, we better start asking some big questions. And so let's just begin to look again at what's been happening today. In the second half of the 20th century in my lifetime, all those changes I mentioned have happened and many more. Far more bodily movement, far more music, long stretches of repeated choruses, far more visual elements like banners and flags, drama, dance, ballet, and the charismatic (laughs) two-step. A whole lot of things have come in. Worship has become very much more informal, 
and very much more casual. We no longer dress for God, we dress for ourselves. In fact, one chorus we were singing two Sundays ago somewhere was, come as you are, come as you are. Encouraging us just to come as we are, full stop. Would you go to a Buckingham Palace garden party just as you are? Tell you a secret, my wife and I are having dinner with the three tenors on August the 7th. And when we found we we're going to be meeting Pavarotti, Domingo and Carreras and staying in the hotel with them. My wife's first thing was, oh, I won't say it because you've already said it. Oh, what shall I wear? What shall I wear? We finally got that one sorted out. And I've had to go to Mosbros. I've never worn an evening dress in my life. Come as you are to church. Who are you coming to meet? Does it honor the Lord if you dress for yourself? Oh, well, it's the weekend, Lord, and I usually dress for myself. I like to dress down at the weekend. Who are you dressing for? Now, listen, I don't think God wants us to put on Sunday best. I don't think he looks at that. He looks at the heart. But it's a symptom it's a symptom of how casual we become. Another symptom is the loss of punctuality. Oh, we needn't turn up on time because they'll just be singing choruses. You know the kind of thing I mean. And I see it again and again, people drifting in. As long as they know they're going to be singing for half an hour, then, well, you can drift in any time. Maybe I'm being critical but we have become very casual. As if we're not meeting anyone terribly important. We dress up to meet the boss at work. We dress up for an interview, for employment. We'd certainly be punctual and very careful to be clean and tidy if we were going to Buckingham Palace for a garden party. But the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, oh well, come as you are. And the worst thing is that if you come as you are outwardly, you come as you are inwardly as well. It's a reflection. The way we behave externally reflects the way we're thinking and feeling internally. Well now, is it all for the better? Or is it all for the worse? Or is it for richer? Or is it for poorer? We're going to take our time answering these questions because we need to go behind what's happening today and ask a very simple question. Why have all these changes taken place? They are more apparent in new fellowships that have never had a tradition of the old style of worship but the new style has crept from the new fellowships into most other existing churches. I was at an Anglican church not long ago and the service was much the same as in a new charismatic fellowship. And uh, there's really very little difference. And one vicar said to me, we've gone charismatic in our church, we now have two guitars well, I don't know what guitars have to do with charismatic. I don't think they have anything to do with it. So the real question is, what have been the influences? Why? What are the reasons for the change? How did it come about? And I want to give you in the next talk six factors that have radically changed our style and content of worship. Some of which are good and some of not so good. But if we know why it's happened, then we're going to be in a better position to look into the future and say, where should we be going? So come back for the second talk, Worship Today.